So the world has been captivated by what has been happening in the UK over the past few weeks, ever since the Southport stabbings, which resulted in the tragic loss of three young lives, Britain has been up in, in chaos. And there's been a lot of things that have happened that have transpired uh, that are those of us here in America actually should be rather concerned about, whether it be Keir Starmer's admission that no matter where they are, social media companies will have to be bound to police information and to ensure racial hatred is not whipped up, whether it be the EU Commission's war against Elon Musk, where they essentially sent him a threatening letter right before he interviewed Donald Trump, saying that if they if he doesn't if he is not careful, then there could be consequences that go to non-compliance with EU ordinances. This has caused a lot of people to ask the question, what is the state of free speech in the West? What is happening in arguably the mother country of the United States, England, and how can we make sense of all of the chaos? Well, today I have with me a, a, a someone who I think is a very important voice in this respect, uh, Nicholas, who is going to help, help us make sense of a lot of this and hopefully shed some light on some of the chaos happening. But as I always do, I don't introduce my guests. They introduce themselves because I believe everyone is their own best representative. So, Nicholas, I'll give you the opportunity to do that right now if you wish. Thank you, Christian. And might I say, I'm very happy to be here. You're an absolute gentleman and everybody should go and subscribe to Christian right now and follow him on X because you know what? He is one of the best conservative accounts out there. Well, my yeah. name is uh, Nicholas or Nick. Uh, feel, free, feel free to call me whatever you like, so long as, it's, so long as it isn't an insult. Uh, I am now an ex-master's student. I've just graduated from university and I am a conservative political activist fighting for freedom I wholeheartedly believe in free speech, and let's just say I am fundamentally opposed to the current government we have in charge here. So I think that tells you everything you need to know about me as a as a man. Well, I think we're um, ready to have a good conversation. One of the things that actually drew me to to you is the fact that you're willing to be, dare I say, provocative, but your provocation is not empty. A lot of voices today are provocative, but they're provocative towards mediocre ends. One of those ends being stirring up dissent online so they can benefit their own pockets as opposed to helping the advance of civil society and Western civilization. You seem to actually care about your country. And in an age where patriotism across the West is becoming rare, and in an age where patriotism amongst people in your generation are especially becoming rare, I think it's a rather important and inspiring thing to see. So I must thank you for that. And on the topic of patriotism in your country and everything like that, mm. so I was reading before the show some of the status updates from the Western media, from American media and some British media about what happened in the UK. And it's almost universally being described on both sides of the Atlantic as a riot. Now, one of the things that I teach my viewers and one of the things that I have taught myself is that whenever you see a bunch of mainstream organizations saying the same thing or saying something similar in the same genre as they're all saying, towing the same line, you should always look for alternative decentralized sources to verify if what they're saying is correct. Some people have taken this principle and they've gone all the way towards this position of what I call informational nihilism, where if something is said by a, a, a credit organization that has been around for a long time, that is associated with the establishment, it can no longer be true simply because that organization said it. I don't encourage people to fall into this trap. This is called the genetic fallacy. It's a bad thing. I think that it actually leaves us vulnerable towards a kind of skepticism that leads to a kind of relativism that erodes the principles necessary to preserve civilization. But from what I have seen in my own research, employing the principle I just laid out, there seems to be, you know, the fact that there were riots, most definitely. And you had several people on the British right, including Andre Farage, somebody who a lot of people on the British right are actually mad about. Maybe we'll get into that in a little second here, saying this is wrong. But then there's other people who were just protesting peacefully, who view themselves as expositors of the English cause, expositors of a sort of call back to sanity, a call back to national self-preservation, a call back to, you know, trying to ground people's perspectives in relation to the mass migration issue. So I know I laid a lot on the table here, but I wanted to give you enough room 
to explain to us exactly what you see and uh, in, in both the media and on the ground and where you think this whole situation is going? Well, Christian, in all honesty, the situation is not very good on the ground here for the last couple of weeks since the Southport stabbings. I happen to coincidentally be in Southport when that happens. Um, I was staying with my grandparents at wow. the time. And the effects on the local community has been devastating. In fact, I I personally have ties, you know, not um, close ties to uh, the families of one of the victims, but um, I do know them. And it's absolutely atrocious what happened to that poor little girl. She'd been stabbed multiple times she's out of hospital now thank god but you know for little kids to go to a taylor swift dance workshop and be stabbed that's not something that happens in a civilized country that's not happen that's not something that happens in a country of law and order and a country of justice and i think what we've seen is a lot of angry people taking to the streets and i was witness to some of what happened and I will be the first to condemn needless rioting against police, the destruction of homes. I spoke to the locals um, who lived in the area of the riots, and they told me that the vast majority of people were out of townies. They were coming in from Liverpool, uh, and they had effectively targeted individuals with absolutely zero ties to what happened, you know, be they cultural or um, even, you know, personal ties to the um, to the attacker himself. And and it was it was all very nasty and very violent. However, as as people in Reform UK have begun to say, you know, this wasn't exactly unexpected because the vast majority of the people who went out to riot and burn down uh, buildings and attack mosques, which is absolutely despicable, disgusting behaviour. I may as well just go out and say this: there is a difference between peaceful protest and going and burning down the local mosque just based off an assumption. I mean, from what I heard, I went to banks uh, where the attacker had come from. And from what I was told by his neighbours, the guy wasn't even a Muslim. He wasn't. Um, he appeared to have no um, religious affiliation whatsoever and just seemed to be a, a wayward teen who had previously gotten in trouble. Um, I recall hearing from one of his neighbours that he had been expelled from school due to carrying a knife and advocated for um, Rwanda-type genocide in the United Kingdom, uh, wow. which was... Very disturbing. Wow. Very, very, very disturbing. I'm still attempting to figure out what exactly he meant by that. However, the individual in question was a second generation Rwandan immigrant born in the United Kingdom. But I, I, I happen to believe that a lot of people made negative assumptions, made bad assumptions about the kid's identity and his motivations for doing this. We still don't know why he did this. However, I'm of the opinion that there was probably a lot of mental health issues there. And I truly mean it when I say there were mental health issues there, because from the people I spoke to in this local community, the kid was not all right in the head. I mean, you mm. would have to be uh, absolutely screwed up, almost a spawn of Satan to go and do what he did to all these innocent children. Mm. But from what I heard in the community, he had previously been in trouble when he was known to law enforcement. However, I, I don't know the extent to which he was. However, we do know he was expelled from school for carrying a knife. So evidently some law enforcement involvement proved necessary. Mm. But... At the same time, I, I saw a lot of a lot of people who took to the streets in anger, but also peacefully protesting. And that's how it should be done. That's how it should be done. People should be allowed to go out and peacefully protest, so long as they it doesn't you know dissolve in, uh, into violence and anarchy, which is what we saw in Southport, which is what we saw all across the country. But mm. the fact of the matter is, is that this is not unique to Southport. However. The fact that these individuals are being charged is an example of two-tier policing in our society, mm -hmm. where they go after one group, which just so happens to be majority white, yet they don't go after the protesters in Hare Hills, who were um, multiracial, multiracial group protesting the removal of Romani children from a family, and who went around rioting and burning down the city. And yet, you know something, Christian, one mm -hmm. of the only people they arrested at the Hare Hills riots in Leeds was a local, a local white woman who went out to try and calm things down and actually get, tried to give lollies to the uh, to the police officers, ice cream lollies, ice lollies, to make them feel better. You know what they did to her? They arrested her. And a good On friend of mine- On what charge? Uh, uh, sorry, what? On what charge? Right? I'm curious. Rioting, effectively rioting. Um, disorder, disorderly conduct, rioting. Wow. Uh, you're in the UK now, even if you witnessed a riot and you're caught out witnessing it, you can be charged and uh, have uh, and you can be locked up for 20 months within three days. They will expedite your case through the system and lock you up. 
Well, I noticed this only appears to be happening to people who attended the uh, albeit disgusting riots against the local Islamic community in Southport and across the country. I do notice it only appears to be happening to them and not the uh, more diverse crowd who attended the riots in Hare Hills and Birmingham. Mm. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And keep in mind, I don't know whether you're aware of this, but there was an incident at Manchester Airport a couple of weeks ago in which a group of Pakistani individuals assaulted a female police officer and broke her nose. And the actions, albeit not very good actions, of one of the police officers at the end in which she stomped on the guy's head, was attempt they have attempted to turn this into Britain's equivalent to George Floyd. Mm. Well, CCTV footage has just come out, which shows that these individuals were entirely responsible for the assault which occurred. They instigated it. They smashed a policewoman in the nose. You can see her nose bleeding and fractured. And yet several weeks down the line, even though they assaulted an officer rather terribly, they still haven't been charged yet. It's mm. ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. There's one rule for specific groups, most of whom are ethnic minority groups, and there is another rule for the rest of us. And, and this cannot continue. And I know people are going to say this is incitement, but it's not. It's not. I'm just pointing out what everybody sees, but people are absolutely terrified to say it. I mean, I've had family members, family members message me absolutely terrified that I'm going to get arrested for talking uh, what I say, so for saying what I say. And yes, I understand I'm provocative, but I have repeatedly condemned the riots. Rising is not the way to voice your opposition to the government. Hmm. It's through signing a petition. It's through going to the ballot box that we have elections next year in this country. And I'll tell you right now, so all the Brits watching this, go and vote and vote for Reform UK because they are the only political party in this country that's actually going to save the nation. That's actually going to prevent stuff from this from happening in the future. We have to hold late. We have to hold Labour to account with a proper opposition, and that's just currently not happening. Currently mm -hmm. not happening. It's it's, it's a mm -hmm. real disgrace. It's a real, it's a real tragedy. What's happened to my country? And I made the point that, from my perspective, as I believe a fairly educated man, and I, I know this is going to sound rather typical of you know modern political uh, jargon talk, but I truly do believe that we're descending into an Orwellian nightmare. I truly believe the country is turning into uh, uh, the Ingsoc airstrip one of George Orwell's 1984. He was only 40 years off. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's an absolute tragedy. It's a real tragedy. And free speech is under attack in this country. It very much is. And regrettably, so long as you amplify misinformation that goes against the regime or whatever they consider to be misinformation, you're going to get charged. But as I... Uh, I believe I mentioned before we began this interview, there was an incident which occurred uh, in Middlesbrough, which is one of the uh, poorest areas of the country. Uh, there was a riot going on, um, heralded by um, by the MDL, the Muslim Defence League in Britain, which is um, a vile um, organisation which should be roundly condemned. Yeah, actually. yeah. In fact, a lot of a lot of the the sentiment I won't call it anti-immigrant because that's a thought terminating cliche. It's a word that's meant to suppress someone's ability to see a position that's not popular in the orthodoxy. But a lot of the I think I'll say pro-English sentiment to be a little bit more benevolent in my phrasing. Uh, has been equated with the English Defense League. And I'm actually, I've been, I used to study hate groups for my, my, in my spare time just for fun, just to see exactly what their ideology was. So the, so the English Defense League was actually one of the groups that people over here in America consider a hate group. I'm not sure how it's considered over there, but yeah. Well, worse than a hate group, I'll tell you that. The EDL yeah. is the boogeyman. In fact, yeah. um, the former First Minister of Scotland, Humza Yusuf, has actually spent the last couple of weeks campaigning for it to be banned. Well, the EDL hasn't exactly existed since 2013. So, uh, you know, even lefties have been coming out and saying, Humza, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing here, buddy? Yeah. I mean, I mean, this is the same idiot who's planning on suing Elon Musk. Um, mm. you know, so he's not exactly very clever. But one of the one of the primary issues um, in this country is fake news. However, the government is taking a very, very, very strange approach to tackling it. Like, for example, uh, during Middlesbrough, there was a, a riot spearheaded by the MDL Muslim Defence League, as I mentioned. And during the riot, a story broke on Twitter by a left-wing journalist by the name of Nick Lowles, who claimed that a woman had had, a Muslim woman, had had acid thrown in her face by a white man. And this information was then retweeted by a Labour MP. Even though this was found to be fake and Nick Lowell's admitted it, he defended his decision to post it. And in fact, he, he defended his decision to keep it up. This inflamed the riots. Mm -hmm. You know, we have 
gangs of uh, people running around Middlesbrough trying to find this chap to put him to justice. And yet Nick Lawless hasn't been charged. The Labour MP who retweeted this information and still has not taken it down, hasn't been charged yet. Yet if you post any sort of quote unquote misinformation about the MDL or any of the diverse crowd of protesters, there's a very good chance you'll get banged up. And, you know, people are yeah. people are going to interpret my words as being Islamophobic or anti or anti-immigrant. Well, I was an immigrant. I lived abroad for 10 years. I, I love the I love the ability for me to go and live abroad. And I think that if you come into a country legally, you reserve every right to settle here. However, you also have to assimilate with our culture and our customs. And for example, the chairman of Reform UK is a Muslim man by the name of Zia Yusuf, an absolute gentleman, a real gentleman. And I have many, many, many Muslim friends who feel the same way that I do, who look at these people and they're just like, oh my God, what are they doing? They're coming to this country, contributing to society, they're living off welfare, and they just cause trouble. Immigration is fantastic. It's wonderful. Of course, if you want to come to this country and live the British dream and contribute and improve the nation, then absolutely you can come here and be patriotic, then yes. But unfortunately, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a bunch of bleeding heart liberals effectively claim that if you point this out, point out that there are certain individuals who shouldn't be in this country, you're branded an istinophobe and they report you to the police, which will probably happen to me after this interview. I, I completely expect that. Um, well, hold sorry. on. Mm. Sorry, I hate you. You're a stream of consciousness thinker, and I, I, it's a beautiful thing. One of the, one of the, the best ways of conveying information, in my opinion, if you can, is always stream of consciousness. I don't, I never use any notes in interviews. I didn't even have any notes for this one, so I appreciate that. But oh, did wow. you just tell me that this interview can get you arrested, or can at least get you investigated by the police? Potentially, yes. Potentially. That is, which is wow. utterly terrifying, utterly terrifying. It, yeah. It's serious. It's gotten to that point. It's gotten to that point. And that is wow. completely and utterly terrifying. And to you Americans out there, you know, you have a very important election coming up in November. And I urge you, I really, really, really urge you, especially after Tim Waltz's comments about freedom of speech on television yeah. recently, mm -hmm. I urge you all, Go and vote for Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, please, for the love of God. Mm -hmm. You have a chance to save your country. If you give it to Kami Kamala and, uh, you know, the horse enjoyer Tim Walls, mm -hmm. you're screwed. Mm -hmm. You're completely and utterly horse screwed. Oh, God. Because, oh God. because uh, I, Kamala... I don't, I, 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 I don't think he's quite a horse enjoyer. I have to just... Right. I have to put that out there. I don't think he... I don't think... I'm just, I'm just making the point. I mean, I saw a rather interesting comments on social media the other no. night. But I mean, I mean, in the UK, I, I mean, this is the difference between the United States and the UK. If I came out with a comment that uh, Sir Keir Starmer enjoyed horses in that way, I'd probably be arrested for misinformation. Though in the United States, you're perfectly within your uh, rights to talk about you know, Tim Waltz in whatever respect you want to speak to, speak to him about. And I, I do apologize for sort of stumbling over my words here, but I'm just trying to be very careful as I don't really fancy being banged up or, and by the way christian i may as well say you end up you might join me in prison because the metropolitan police are actually looking into potentially extraditing american influencers who are apparently stirring up racial hatred people like cattard and gunter eagleman and benny and stephen crowder it's uh, insanity the, uh, it's uh, insanity yeah well so uh, well we'll discuss that in a second because i have a, oh. a whole range of thoughts on that particular issue but i kind of want to go back to you said a lot in that stream of consciousness uh, flow, and it was beautiful, but I got to go back to the earlier part of it. So you mentioned uh, two-tier policing, and that's a topic I really want to dig into. Because here in America, we also have our own our own phrase for that, we call it two tiers of justice. And I, my assumption is that the British political discourse was in some way influenced about how we talked about the two tiers of justice in reference to how Donald Trump was charged with trumped up charges that defied jurisdictional requirements, defied basic legal precedents, defied basic constitutional mandates, and also defied basic legal legal logic on all to serve some political agenda. But when people say two tiers, it 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 makes me think of the nature of justice. Because justice ideally has levels, 
but those levels are applied to everyone within those levels appropriately. But when you have a counterfeit notion of justice, that says that justice is no longer about, because my definition of justice is very much endemic to what the natural law thinkers of the 18th century thought justice was. The Scottish Enlightenment, to borrow a phrase from over there, they believed, and I'll give an example, Lord Kames, who was, he influenced Adam Smith. He was David Hume's mentor. He had an outsized influence on the intellectual trajectory of the West. He influenced America's founding. Got a video coming out on that very soon, actually. He said that justice was a defensive principle. That it was a defensive principle that ensures contracts are fulfilled, that ensures property is protected, that ensures promises that are made within the legal context are kept, and that ensures persons are also protected. Well, that's a, ju a justice based on a set of principles that are rooted in human social relationships. Well, then you have the idea of social justice or other names for it, distributive justice, whatever. That says, no, justice is primarily about how law can be applied to move around social and material resources, they'll say. Social resources being the means of, of living, material resources being the things that enable you to get by economically in a way that helps those who are the most disadvantaged. And so under that notion of justice, which seems to be the notion of justice that Keir Starmer and his friends subscribe to, they can justify hate speech laws. They can justify this kind of two tiers because to them, it's not to, – to, to them, the two tiers are actually not the two tiers. To them, there's more than two tiers, and those tiers are justified by virtue of equity. And so I find it very interesting that you have this, this sort of counterplay happening here and that a lot of people intuitively have this sense of justice within them that says, no, this is not correct. And rightly so, by the way, because it's not correct. This is not how it should happen. Justice should be equal. Evidently. But, but then they don't realize that the ideology and power says, no, in order to be morally good, justice has to be unequal. Because people live unequally, and therefore we need to have equity. I think that's what you guys are facing over there. That's the well. It is. It is very much akin to that, and yeah. I think especially in what we're seeing with um, the recent release of forty thousand violent criminals um, in mm. our nation. Um, Starmer had a sensational idea to free up prison space, not by deporting the. 12,000 illegals who are currently um, in, in imprisoned in the United Kingdom for various offensives, but were to uh, release violent criminals back onto our streets, some of whom actually included the leaders of um, grooming gangs and Rotherham, mm -hmm. which is just... No, don't say that term. Don't say that, because that, uh, allegedly uh, grooming gangs don't exist, don't you know? <laughs> <It's>... Wow. <laughs> well, a... I mean... Uh, you know, labor gangs, no-go zones, all of those just are mythologies of the far right, right? I can tell you right now, they certainly do exist. They, they certainly do exist. And a Labour MP a couple of years ago, I don't know whether you heard of this, she actually retweeted a uh, satirical comment made by uh, somebody at the time the Rochdale grooming gangs were exposed, basically saying that uh, the girl should have shut up in the face of uh, preserving the, the beautiful diversity of our society. It's it's disgusting. It's It's well and truly disgusting. I mean, these people are apologists for this type of terrible behaviour. And what I find especially egregious about uh, contemporary British justice is the fact that this is uh, this sort of streamlining through the judicial system of one group of people, but the very, very, very slow, almost antiquated approach taken to another slightly more diverse crowd of people is being supported by, uh, quote unquote, liberals, people who should believe in freedom, who should believe in justice, who should believe in fairness before the law, yet the sheer amount of people who I've seen over the past couple of days screaming, lock them up, lock them up, lock them up and throw away the key. Now, I don't agree with some of the comments made by some of these uh, people. In fact, some of them are quite vile who have been sentenced to 20 months in prison. In fact, one man in particular made a particularly nasty, disgusting comment. However, does that deserve prison? Does that deserve prison? I don't think so. I don't think it does. I thought we lived in a free society. I thought that you could post what you want within reason, so long as you're not actively calling for people to take to the streets and attack people of a certain group. It's ridiculous. Mm. And yet 
simply voicing your opposition to the establishment narrative or saying something even slightly politically incorrect. And what this guy said wasn't just slightly, it was very politically incorrect and very rude, might I add. And I wholeheartedly disapprove of that. But at the same time, does saying mean stuff when you're not technically hurting anyone or encouraging any sort of violent action? Does that necessitate 20 months in prison? Does that mm. justify that? Mm. And it's not just people who are 40, 50 year olds being charged. Um, the UK government has actually begun charging 12 to 13 year olds with committing crimes of this nature. Mm. In fact, uh, one 13 year old, I believe, was charged for simply riding his bike into a riot. And as I mentioned to you earlier, you could now be charged for even observing a riot. Yeah, I saw uh, a, a, a man in Belfast was actually charged, 18 year old man was actually charged with just looking at a riot or looking at a protest or whatever. And the judge, yes. the, re the reasoning that the judge said is that if you look at it, if you are in the presence, you are effectively participating in it. Now, oh, I don't think that judge has any philosophical training. I don't think that judge is used to justifying their premises because that's a non sequitur if I ever heard one. Well, I, I don't think that judge has any common sense to begin with. I mean, that, that's absolutely ridiculous. By that logic, you should charge every single one of the congressmen and women who witnessed January 6th because they were there. Mm, they yeah. should all be charged. Well, they, they must have participated. Well, th th unfortunately, this same kind of logic was deployed against people on January 6th. There were oh, you know, folks that were just it's walking true. around who were you charge exactly. with trespassing and uh, things that ultimately we all, we all saw the velvet rope we yeah, all saw absolutely. i mean what what a, what a yeah. tremendous riot they followed the velvet rope absolutely, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Just the points i'm making here is is that it is wholeheartedly two tier in every conceivable respect like i said why hasn't nick Lowell's been charged yet for knowingly spreading misinformation riling people up because it's all about incitement to violence that's what they're getting people on so why hasn't Nick Lowell's been charged with incitement for violence? And what's even stranger is, and I made a video about this, is the media's complete insistence that this is just the work of far-right white supremacists and that the violence in Britain is the res entire result of bigotry. And they're even calling this the hashtag Farage riots now. I know Nigel personally. Mm. He's got nothing to do with this. He's roundly condemned the rioters and the riots. He just acknowledges why these people are going out there and why they're upset and why they're angry. Because these are people of the working class who've been ignored for 40 to 50 years. But yeah. as I was saying about the media, uh, you know, we had Sky News uh, that were on the ground in Birmingham having the temerity to claim that the vast majority of rioters were white, you know, 20-year-old guys who just come off the council states. Then they zoom in on a group of Muslim Defence League members wielding samurai swords. Which was mm -hmm. insanity. Yeah. Absolute insanity. And then we had prominent left wing accounts in Britain attempt to gaslight the public into thinking that no, 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 they weren't holding samurai swords. They were holding broomsticks. Yes, broomsticks. Really? I know what a broomstick looks like. That was not a broomstick. That was a, that was a katana. You know, you know, I've, I've seen those, the, those gangs running around with 12 inch knives and swords and stuff. And they, they don't, those are oh, not broomsticks. Oh, from Unless or someone's broom. manufacturing broomsticks that now look like samurai swords. Maybe <laughs> maybe the cult of the weeaboo has infested Britain. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> maybe British manufacturers oh, I, I, I are becoming... hope not. We don't need those people here. <laughs> we, we, maybe we, British we, we manufacturers have got enough issues. We, we do not need um, the Russo runners attempting to storm military bases now. We don't need that. <laughs> we don't need that in prison. And, and for those of you who don't know what a weeaboo is, please don't, don't, don't even look it up. It's just... Don't worry. But no, your life is better off not knowing what that is. Anyway, please go I, on. I, wholeheart I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> and for all the people who do search it up, please, you know, don't blame us. Don't blame us. It was your own fault. It was your own fault. You know, you know what they said about curiosity? It killed the cat. But, yeah. but satisfaction, that? you know, brought it back to you. So there's that part of it. <laughs> but, but, but no, actually, so I, I so. Okay, again, you're saying quite a lot, and I, and as you're saying things, several thoughts are being provoked within my mind about how all this connects. So let's actually kind of dig deeper into you know around the two tier issue relating to cult, the, uh, relating to I think this is fundamentally from what I see. You let me know if I'm, if I'm correct. An I'm issue of cultural resentment, because ultimately. A culture's moral or legal concepts are going to be influenced by the perceptions of their people, i.e. cultural 
viewpoint. It's cultural self-awareness, I call it. And so a culture that lends itself towards a kind of paternalism or a managerialism is going to have a sense of justice that is very absent, that is counterfeit, that is imitative. And that leads to certain kinds of outcomes like this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you saw my video and everything. I talked about parliamentary absolutism. I did. And, uh, it's, 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 it's atrocious. And, and why do you, why do you think parliamentary absolutism for people don't know that know what that is? So, and I'm sure Nicholas can add on to this if he, if he wants to. So for a very mm -hmm. long time in, in the, in Britain, Royal absolutism was the dominant political principle. There were other principles, of course. There were noble classes, things of that sort. There was Magna Carta, which you know, gave rights to a specific group of people, but not to everybody, obviously. But up until the Glorious Revolution, it's widely considered, according to Orthodox historians, there may be debate about this, that royal absolutism was the primary political principle. Then parliamentary absolutism became the primary political principle. And our founders in America actually responded exactly to that. And several founders of the colonies, like, for example, you have William Penn. William Penn, founder of, arguably the founder of Quakerism, founder of Pennsylvania, he was literally given land by the British government to leave because he was defending religious minorities. And according to the law in that country at that time, religious minorities of certain sects were not privileged and they would get taken to court. And they got annoyed about William Penn doing that. So they actually just said, here's Pennsylvania, leave us alone. And so our so founders actually that name, I'll give you absolutism because they believe that legitimacy from law comes from a place higher than law itself. But we see with Edmund Burke and others that within the British tradition, parliamentary absolutism is absolutely a, a justified and a well-studied thing. Do you think that it's the cause of a lot of the servility that you're seeing right now towards <laughs> these um, free speech encroachments? And also adding on to that, do you think that parliamentary absolutism, if it is the cause has a long shelf life still left, or is it possible that it'll be the yoke of, will be shaken off your people eventually? Well, firstly, what happened to Mr. Penn reminds me of that meme, I'll pay you $50 to go away. <laughs> uh, certainly reminds me of that. But going back to your question on parliamentary absolutism, in my view, I think it's already dead. I think we're moving more towards a unitary political body in Downing Street. In my view, because we've seen this over the last couple of governments. I mean, we saw uh, this sort of began, in my view, uh, with the Johnson government when he uh, decided to prorogue Parliament mm. for, uh, mm -hmm. for several months, which um, was met with round condemnation from the Labour law, who argued that people need their voice in Parliament. Well, right now, you know, people don't have their voices represented in Parliament. Mm. Only about 30% of the electorate voted for this new government. 70% of Brits do not want Sir Keir Starmer in power, and he knows that. Mm. And the public outcry to him and the outrage has been just, quite frankly, astounding. And he definitely knows that. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to concentrate power in himself. In my view, he's always gone a bit power mad. He's effectively a tin pot dictator by this point. Only within a month of becoming prime minister, which just shows you, you know, he clearly had in this, this intention from the start. And I would argue that in his mind, and we have seen this centralization of power in Downing Street, in number 10 and number 11, in Downing Street and the Chancellor's home, um, is for the purpose of speeding up government. As I think successive prime ministers have found that parliament is a very fickle bunch yeah. a very thick group of people who spend most of their time arguing or getting drunk in the parliamentary bar. So Interesting. in my view, um, the prime minister has become more of a, an American president type figure. In fact, I think that the presidentialization of campaigns, which came about in 1992 with Neil Kinnock's failed bid to become prime minister against Sir John Major, has really caught on. And as that yeah. has caused, you know, personalities and ego has come to define our politics. I think that parliamentary absolutism has very slowly, but, you know, melted away and has been replaced with Downing Street absolutism or executive absolutism, or whatever you like to call it. Yeah. But uh, I would argue that effectively the prime minister, um, you know, holds the, holds the pen here. He holds the sword. He is able to do as he pleases now, especially with a, a parliament that's uh, actually currently, I believe, on holiday right now. It's on recess, on summer recess. Um, and Reform UK, my political party, the party that I'm most fond of, I'm a member of the uh, party, just for you know, people at home. Um, they have been repeatedly calling for uh, power to be returned back to Parliament for a recess, for the recess to be ended so we can have a proper debate on national security. But you know what Starmer said? He said, no, 
No, I'm not recording Parliament. No, I'm just going to rule by decree from Downing Street. And that's what he's been doing. And all of these extremely draconian laws have come from him, not from Parliament. They've come directly from number 10. They've so all come from number 10. All so, so in the strictest sense, parliamentary absolutism is no longer the guiding principle of England, obviously, because if it was, they'd be able to easily handle the situation and reign in Downing Street. But in a different sense, would you say that a part of its legacy still remains and is the validating principle of Starmer's attempt to grab power in the sense that legal absolutism was a core principle of parliamentary absolutism, the idea that the law itself reigns supreme and the lawmaker, by virtue of that, also reigns supreme. I, I say this because when I, as an American, evaluate the United Kingdom's laws about hate speech, I forgot which law I was looking at, but it was like the law that regulates uh, hateful conduct online or whatever. I'm sure you've been over yeah, that, 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 uh, that is that is the law that keeps me up at night. I, yeah, and, and I'm, so I'm terrified by that law. And so, that, in my opinion, that law is an example of legal absolutism, um, and I'm sure you, you could see why. Because very simply, because it 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 overrides any moral consideration to do with free speech. And it simply asserts the law as the arbiter is what you're going to say. That's legal absolutism and, and just up in, in, in um, sort of charitable, uh, benevolent seeming clothing. So is that is that what's going on here? Because when, when a unitary executive rules by fiat, that's a sense of legal absolutism in a very, I would say, disjointed sense, because you're not having the processes of Congress in America's case or the processes of, of, of uh, parliament validate what's happening. But you are still having something with the force of law clamp down the people and overtake mm -hmm. civil society. Well, I would argue, going back to your first point, that yes, their parliamentary absolutism absolutely forms the basis upon which everything Keir is doing right now. I mean, he has a massive majority of 410 seats in the, in the Houses of Commons. Uh, I mean, he is he effectively destroyed the Conservative Party at the last election, despite, ironically, getting less votes than Jeremy Corbyn did in both 20. Uh, 17 and 2019, he absolutely annihilated the Conservative Party. And might I add, the Conservatives deserve to be annihilated because they're not conserving anything except for the country's GDP. They don't give a toss about our cultural <laughs> tradition, rule of law. In <laughs> fact, you know, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer are good buddies behind the scenes, but that's besides the point. Um, in my uh, view, of course, most of this stuff is, of course, um, the basis on which law is introduced by an MP. So fundamentally, everything that is passed through the commons is technically the voice of the people. But the way in which it's being applied right now by the executive and number 10 is most certainly antithetical to the voice of the people. It's not. It's absolutely not. that The law is being applied in so many weird and wonderful ways to get people banged up. I mean, this is unheard of. I believe when the people who passed the law, who probably had very good intentions, you know, they probably in their own minds thought, oh, this will make people feel much safer in my constituency. Well, they've effectively held in, held it in the rise of a police state. And it's it's atrocious. It's saddening. It's, it's despicable. And we have a prime minister who's effectively abusing the law right now and abusing the power, which we have entrusted him with. And it, it's just a disgrace. And unfortunately, you know, he's, he's got complete control over his party, 410 seats in parliament. There is not going to be a snap election of any kind until 2029. So what we have to do now is we have to get out there and not protest violently or hold demonstrations. No, 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 no. A much more powerful message would be in 2025 at the local elections is if we all go to the ballot box and vote for Reform UK. Because I think that democracy is the most powerful weapon that we have. Not violent disorder and protesting. That's ridiculous. And quite frankly, if you're going to go out and protest and be violent, don't. You're only going to end up being arrested and you're going to further damage the credibility of the movement. Because mm -hmm. Keir Starmer is going to put you up on a big screen and say, look at this horrible man here. This is what he did to a bin in Merseyside. So we're going to lock him up for 23 months, you know? Um, so in my view, I think the most powerful weapon imaginable to fight back against this, against this erosion of free speech, is democracy itself. So we all need to go and fight. We all need to go and fight at the ballot box. We need to go and leaflet. We need to go and campaign, a year-round campaign. And then we just don't stop the campaign until 2029 when we're able to vote these lunatics out of office completely. So... In my view, there there is hope. There is certainly hope to return to um, parliamentary absolutism in its entirety, because Parliament is the voice of the people, not the Prime Minister. 
The prime minister is a single individual who answers to his constituency, technically. But yet, uh, because he is the leader of the you know, main party in the House of Commons, he is by virtue appointed the leader of the government. Yet he just doesn't represent all Brits and he shouldn't be governing like he does. So I have a few more areas I want to touch on before we close out. Um, let's, okay, since we're on the issue of legal absolutism, because I was going to pivot to a different area, but so we're on those issues. I'll, I'll say here for one last second. Go ahead, there go have ahead. been some people, some commenters I've seen uh, in the UK that have suggested that the antidote to a lot of the abuses of Starmer's power would be an American style Bill of Rights and Constitution. Now, what is your personal opinion of that? Do you think that fits in? I see you shaking your head. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Oh, yeah. Oh, did, did, oh I love that. that did, 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 very do you excited. think, okay, okay, you like it. Okay. Do you think that fits in with the current cultural milieu of the UK? Can it be sustained? And what would the implications of that look like if something like that were to be implemented? Because you obviously, if you were to do that, arguably, the NHS, one of the prized sacred cows that even the venerable Margaret Thatcher, someone, by the way, who I've studied and I admire immensely in many respects, she wouldn't touch that. And if I think I think if she was a, a free market purist, she would have probably addressed it. She didn't touch it. So how would – and a lot of the British public likes the NHS. So how would that work out? Because, you know, I, I think there might be complications with that part as well. Well, um, I like to say that the NHS is our fourth branch of government. Um, it is it, it is an established institution. It's uh, it, it, it's as, it's like uh, you lot getting rid of the treasury in the United States. You know, it's, it's an, although I, I'm sure you'd love to do that. Um, some things aren't entirely practical, and the NHS is so beloved in our country. However, you know, I have an auntie who works at the NHS. Lovely lady. All of her, you know, staff are absolutely amazing people. But at the same time. I think that the almost veneration of the NHS has gone a bit too far. I mean, we have children who come on every couple of years or so on TV and sing a hymn in praise of the NHS, like it's some sort of deity that you have to sing to and also please. I think it's angry. It's, it's almost cult-like in a way. But going back to your original point, 100,000%. Yes, 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 yes. We need a bill of rights. We need a proper codified Bill of Rights and a codified constitution in this country because what I find absolutely terrifying is, in a way, how easy it would be just to do away with freedom of speech through just a simple pass of legislation in the Commons, which is signed by the King. And I may as well say the King is not going to turn away anything from the Commons, and he has actually expressed his support of Keir Starmer's crackdown on the protesters, on the riots, and of the yeah. harsh sentences. Whilst I'm not going to say anything entirely negative of the king, I am a staunch royalist. I will criticize his inability to, as his forebearers have, including Edward, to look and acknowledge the plight of the working people and understand why they have taken to the streets in anger, even though I vehemently disagree with that as a tactic. And I think if you are going to go out onto the streets and burn police cars and hit people and uh, attack people based on how they look, their skin color, their uh, or their physical appearance, you should most certainly be banged up. But at the same time, I think what we're seeing is sort of top-down elitism coming from our establishments. And I think that the um, sort of the, the signing of a British Bill of Rights would go a long way in fixing that. Because these people, they feel like they're invincible. They feel like they can go after us with no consequences. Well, what we need in this country is a Bill of Rights so so we can feel protected, so free speech is protected, so I don't have to be tippy-toeing around, terrified that if I say the wrong thing, I'm going to get arrested. And this is why I've sort of been speaking over myself a bit in this interview, because I'm genuinely a little bit worried that I could get a knock on the door by police in the morning, which is is truly terrifying. And, and, and we live in live in a free society and that should not be the case and, and by the way i i think the fact that that is a looming reality over you and you're still willing to speak your heart actually shows the bluff of authoritarianism so authoritarianism one of its to the extent that it has any justifying argument i think that ultimately it's a morally corrupt and politically uh, uh, inept doctrine but to the extent that it does have any justifying arguments is that it maintains social cohesion and it allows a government to happen more uh, more expediently. And that also it encourages good behavior in society. Now, obviously, all this is bogus, but the, the last part particularly is what's being exposed right now as you speak, because 
the ethos that the Starmer government obviously wants to instill in the British people that it is benevolent to have no questions about other cultures that come into your country and refuse to uh, integrate. It is it is kind and neighborly not to speak up, even though there's obvious destruction happening. It is evil merely to look use your eyes to look at something that's happening in your community. This ethos is being disproven by you because you're not accepting it, even though the force of law is over you to accept it. And it just goes to show you that the law fundamentally does not, it cannot, it's not a good conduit for virtue. It is a poor conduit for any kind of virtue, assumed, real, foe, fo, whatever. And I think that if authoritarians were self-aware, if they weren't personal tyrants, they would realize that. A personal mm -hmm. tyrant, I was talking about this in another video of mine, is someone who is so controlled by an un by unrestrained passions that they are unable to to regulate themselves and see things with clear eyes. So a personal tyrant, for example, would maybe be an excessive alcoholic. Maybe it would be a pyromaniac in a more extreme case. Maybe it would be someone that has an extreme gambling problem. In this case, a personal tyrant would be a politician that is so drunk on power and drunk on their own hubris that they can't apply their rational faculties to understanding what needs to happen for good good political order to be birthed. I think that Keir Starmer, if I may say it, is a personal tyrant in the sort of sense that Xenophon would say it. Um, maybe that makes me susceptible for getting arrested. I don't know, but it seems like it. Oh, if, if, if you do, I look forward to join. I look forward to you joining us all in prison. That would be lovely. Uh, no, uh, this actually is like, like grabbing it, dodging uh, from the commissary. I'll have you. No, it's it's funny. So. Before we get into that, let, let me ask again about the Bill of Rights. So the people, and you know this very well, Nick, there, there is actually historically an English Bill of Rights based almost entirely on Lockean principles. And I was having a conversation with one of my British friends and I, I asked him like, hey, why, why isn't this really observed in your country? And it, it was a very, he gave me a very interesting answer. I want to know your answer. Why is the English Bill of Rights, which was codified centuries ago, not really observed in your country? Well, in my view, I think it's because the vast majority of the population doesn't even know it exists. I think really, if you were to go down on the high streets and ask the average Brits, do you think we have a Bill of Rights? They'll say, no, no. The really? people know about Magna Carta, but I don't think the vast majority of people know about the British Bill of Rights. I just don't think they do. I just don't think the public are, quite frankly, educated enough to know that. Really? That's from my experience, because whenever when I've spoken about a Bill of Rights that you know, signed centuries back, many people just have no idea what I'm talking about. Have really? no idea what I'm talking about. No idea what I'm talking about whatsoever. They believe, the vast majority of people believe that sovereignty derives from Parliament, that personal, that liberty and personal sovereignty derives from Parliament. Yeah. Or the king. When in actuality we have our own individual liberty as set out yeah. in the British Bill of Rights. This is yeah. the parliamentary absolutism we're talking about, right? It's exactly, and exactly. And I think that's why the vast majority of people, because they're just not really that well aware of you know the fact that we even have a British Bill of Rights. I think that's why they're so willing to accept this encroaching authoritarianism. But going back to your your other point, uh, I I have never been afraid to speak out. Um, you know, going back to when I was a kid and when Trump declared he was running for the presidency, I was one of his fiercest supporters and defenders, which uh, Me as well. let's just say it was, the, it was sort of the immense chagrin of my of my contemporaries in my classroom. Um, you know, in Spain, in Barcelona, I also supported Brexit as well, which made me effectively the devil. I was supporting the two great evils of Western society. Yes, I, I've always stood through and I've supported what I believe in and I'll continue to stand up and shout from the rooftops, uh, you know, till the day I pop my clogs and end up in a box. You know, and I think that's so important. I think that if young people don't stand up and fight for what they believe in, no matter, you know, what may happen, and although I have been a bit jittery tonight in trying to make sure that I don't get arrested by um, by Keir Starmer's secret police, uh, which hopefully I won't be. Ho hopefully uh, they can't figure out how to get onto American YouTube and I'll be fine. But... <laughs> You know, uh, fingers crossed. But I'm 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 more than willing to always stand up for what I believe in. I don't believe in violent protest or violent action. But you know, what I do believe in. I believe in democracy and I believe in freedom. And I believe that we can solve all of these nations, all of this nation's issues through democracy. In effect, I would advocate for an almost Swiss-style system of direct democracy. 
I think that's that's the best style of democracy. Is that is that the answer though? Is 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 popular consent in the most undistilled form the answer? I like the Republican version of popular consent, where there's institutions that intermediate between the, the will of the people and what actually ends up happening. Just because the the, mo- the the tyranny of the majority is just as dangerous, in my opinion, as the tyranny of the uni- of the unitary executive. Well, I'm of the opinion that, you know, considering what's going on in our country right now, I think that we do need more popular representation in government. That makes sense. In, yeah. my, in my humble opinion, I, I think considering the the failure of parliamentary democracy, which we have seen, I mean, Reform UK, despite getting the third highest vote share in the country, ends yeah. up with five seats overall. Meanwhile, the Lib Dems who came in fourth ended up with uh, 70 odd seats, which is you know, a travesty. Um, And in my view, the only way in which we can fix this country is through proper change. And proper change comes through the will of the people. I'm sure if we have a referendum on whether whether or not to completely change up our parliamentary system, it would pass. But if we're going to do this through parliament itself, it's never going to work because our elected representatives have an interest in, uh, you know, I like to say that fundamentally, All sides, um, all the politicians in our country are fundamentally institutional conservatives. They want to keep the things, they want things bumbling along as they are because they wholeheartedly benefit from it. They benefit from it. Some of these people sit in Parliament for 25, 30 years collecting dust, you know, earning a a salary off the public Mm. who... To the vote who go and vote for them every five years and they don't actually change anything because it's lucrative. It's incredibly lucrative for the vast majority of MPs to keep things exactly the same. And that's why, in my opinion, that's the reason why they're not going after Starmer. They're not going after the prime minister because they're afraid of things changing. When things do change, they may not end out and end up on top. So in my view, they have a reason to keep everything the same. They have a reason to, um, you know, persist in the status quo, in the status quo politics. And in my view, the only way in which we can effectively change society for the better and save this country, and in a way to borrow a slogan from America, make Britain great again, Hmm. is Hmm. to completely have the people take power. Yeah. Now you mentioned that you that you and by the way, if that's hot, if that is the strategy for Britain to retain or rather regain the sort of English. Well, I mean, I'm, rights, I'm only one man. I'm only one man. If, but, but, no, if, <laughs> if that is the solution, if that's the like solution, here, if that's a solution for Britain to re- regain the English tradition of rights, because by the way, look, some of my biggest intellectual influences come from the United Kingdom. Uh, so you guys have a immense groundswell of moral philosophy and political philosophy going all the way back to the 18th century, 17th century, that you can pull on to do this. And it's happened before with the English Bill of Rights that no one knows about. It's happened before. And so if this is the solution to implement that, then I think that's great. And I truly hope that that works out or that people at least gain awareness about that. That's very important. So I, I we hope so as well. Yeah, I, I, truly, I think the, the state of the country, the country is in decline, Christian, and the country is completely falling apart. Society, My country is in decline too, actually. My, mine's in decline as well. Well, <laughs> society hasn't totally collapsed in the states. At least I, I don't think so. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't been stateside in a very long time. Well, society has crumbled. It, it doesn't exist anymore. And anyone who claims it does is an idiot. So yeah. In, in certain cities in America, society is almost, it's, it's very unfortunate. Like if you're in Los Angeles, for example, you may get harangued by a homeless person. Or if you're in Washington, D.C., you may have uh, all, piles of trash and cat-sized rats running across your feet as you walk down the capital of the strongest, most populous, uh, most not, not most populous, most most prosperous, rather. China's the most populous, or India's the most populous, the most That's prosperous so country in the world. What's that? Mentioned cat-sized rats. Yes. So actually, I was I was I was, a, I was I was in front of the White House a few weeks ago. I was in down in D.C. and I heard a skittering, a kind of skittering sound in the trash nearby. I'm like, what in the world is that? I look over and I see like a rat this big run across the streets right in front of the White House, and people were just looking. I like it wasn't one of Biden's advisors. I mean, yeah, he we were just. Like, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Well, <laughs> maybe they maybe they can shape shift. Maybe the yeah, you sure that wasn't just the chairman of the DNC coming to <laughs> good old Joe. Maybe they, they can shape shift. Maybe the theory is correct, right? 
maybe maybe instead of reptilian shapers, we have like uh, we have like uh, that's, that's, that's actually just super rats who rule the rule the country. Super rats. Yeah, we have rodentia shapers. Well, the, the, the reptiles is the actual style, but it's the super rats that came up with the exactly. theory. Right, David, I got it wrong, just in terms of direction, not in terms of content. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. man, that man is a maniac. <laughs> no, he's 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 hilarious, but he's terrifying at the same time. And the fact that oh, he, I mean, people he, like he's him. Abs, he's ab just, just just make it abundantly clear to everyone at home. David Icke is a lunatic. Please don't arrest him. No, it's him. funny. People I don't, like I don't him, endorse him. People like him, who I would uh, argue, perhaps spreads social toxins more than someone like you. People like him can just speak and say all kind of this crazy stuff, and they're not considered a, a threat, even though Ike considers himself a threat. He says, well, uh, I'm nobody, a threat because no, I'm also... I mean, he's a clown. Nobody nobody takes him seriously. He's a complete and utter clown. I mean, the fact that he considers himself a threat just shows that he's completely delusional. He's not. Nobody cares about yeah. him. He, he can say whatever the hell he wants. The government won't arrest him. Because they, they call himself don't... the son of God. <laughs> <laughs> So, so. No, I mean, I mean, David I could literally advocate for taking over the government and, and um, you know, the British government, they wouldn't do anything. Tutsi Akir wouldn't arrest him because they, he'd just be like, no, he's, he's got about five people in a dock following him. You know? <laughs> so, like, he's, he's a joke. <laughs> but um, it's not about it's not about Tony Robinson. It's not about Donald Trump. It's not about Kamala Harris. It's not about Tim Walls. It's about civilization. And the things that happen within civilization that have broader downstream consequences. And, mm -hmm. and, and this is something that really grinds my gears. Because a lot of people will say, oh, Christian, you're a Trump supporter. Well, what you've done there, you've done a few things that are offensive to me there. And these people don't even realize they're doing it. Number one, you have reduced my entire political thinking to one point in time, to a very small point in time, to a very singular individual and you've collapsed every consideration that you're going to make about my positions to him so essentially you have reduced my ability to be an intellectually a variant thinker and you think i'm a simple person and very few things get under my skin but if you call me a simple person there's two things i don't like number one when people compare me to other people that pisses me off even if the comparison is nice Pisses me off. Number two, when people think I'm simple, that really pisses me off. That well, like you, you can call me any kind of name you want to. You can be anything, but if you call me simple or suggest it, oh man, I'm gonna call the cavalry, man. We're gonna come. We're gonna have. We're gonna have war. <laughs> and oh, well, I'll tell you right now. I'll tell you right now. You are not simple in the slightest. You are <laughs> an absolute genius, and I would encourage everybody but, watching. No, no, it's, but, but, uh, you're very, very nice, brother, but no. You're very nice. I appreciate it. But point is this. When someone says oh, you're a Trump supporter, no, you're reducing me to the smallest possible possibility that I that I could be and ignoring everything else. In the words of Kamala Harris, you are burdening me. And I want you to unburden me. Okay? <laughs> so really, that's what they're doing. That's number one. But 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 number two, they're also reflecting their own ignorance. They're also mm -hmm. reflecting their own lack of political political horizons. The only way to really understand politics in any case, I don't care if it's electoral politics or whatever, is to understand the history of ideas and understand the values that flow from that. You have demonstrated throughout this conversation that you have a good understanding of the, of the history of ideas and the history of politics in your country. You recited 1990s, you've gone all the way back. That's how you really understand things because otherwise you'll see things as occurring in a vacuum and you'll miss out on some very important perspective. And so, mm -hmm. no, when people say, are you a Trump supporter? I say, no, I am. I state my ideology. I say I am a constitutional conservative. I'm someone that believes in this premise, this premise, this premise. I'm someone that believes a country should have a strong border, should have a strong, cohesive culture, should have a strong, a strong citizenry and assertive citizenry that is willing to correct those in authority and be eternally vigilant when and when necessary. And whatever candidate happens to line up with that overall framework, I support happens to be Donald Trump. Or could there be more perfect candidates to do that in the future? Yeah, of course there could be. But right now, he's my best choice, and I happily will vote for that, or I happily will push that. But it's not him. It's the civilizational ideas. And so in your case, it's not Tommy Robinson. It may not even be Nigel Farage. It's the whole ethos of reform 
that says British culture actually matters. English culture is a real thing. Assimilation is the very bare minimum for a civil society to exist and not only to exist, because you can exist and not flourish, but also to flourish. I think the the what reform acknowledges is that you, know, you can have people of all different religions and sexual orientations in the party. I mean, you know, I'm Jewish, our chairman is a Muslim. Uh, the previous deputy leader was gay. Um, the other previous deputy leader was uh, originally from Pakistan. And the only thing that unites, the thing that unites everybody, everybody in reform is just a shared love for our country. I mean, I was at the um, reform NEC rally in Birmingham. I was the location producer on that shoot. And I saw um, Sikh men coming in wearing turbans that were the Union Jack. And people of all different cultures and races and sexual orientations and mm -hmm. desires and ages coming in yeah. in a display of unity and love for the country. Because as I argue in so many of my videos, and I don't really like to use the term argue because I think it's too, you know, strongly worded in this case, as I, as I like to represent in my videos, I think reform is the party of love. And it's not just about one man. It's not just about, you know, ego or anything like that. It's a movement. It's a collective movement in our country to guarantee us all individual liberty. And the ironic, ironic how I say it's a collective movement to guarantee us individual liberty. Yeah. But I would argue that the, the only, the primary thing that separates reform from the other political parties of Britain and why I'm so keenly why I so keenly support the party is the fact that it's just predicated on love. It's built upon love. It is an inherently loving political institution. It's a loving political party. We love our country. We love everybody in our party. We love, regardless of what colour you are, regardless of your background, regardless of your sexual orientation, if you love reform and if you love this country, then you're welcome in reform. If you're a patriot, you're welcome in reform. And that is the type of patriotism we're trying to ferment in British society, where it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, but so long as you eat, you can be an immigrant, doesn't matter. But if you integrate into our society, you wave the Union Jack proudly, you love this nation, then absolutely you are welcome with us. And... Uh, I have an issue with the sort of exclusive nationalism of certain other political parties in Britain. And one of the reasons why I love reform so much is the fact that it addresses all of the concerns that, you know, nationalists and patriots do have. But at the same time, it's a pleasant, very kind, very loving, very accepting political party and movement, which I believe in five years time will completely transform Britain. I think we're going to win in 2029. I'm, I'm convinced of that. If in little under four weeks of campaigning, we're able to get five seats, which is completely unheard of in Britain, yeah. with a totally brand new political party. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we actually came second in 92 seats across the country, you know, some of which only by very small amounts, I think we're going to do fantastic at the 2029 general election. And what we have to keep doing is we have to keep fighting for hope and optimism in this country. We have to keep fighting for a patriotism based off hope and love that is that that is united by our shared love for the country, you know, and that isn't torn apart by such superficial differences of, you know, if you're, you know, what if you're a Muslim or Jew? Doesn't matter to me. I don't care. What yeah. I care about is if you love this country and if you're a hardworking, respectable member of society. So last question before we go, because this has been amazing. I think that we've had, we've covered a lot of ground here. I, I do apologize for rambling on a bit. I get, no. I, I get like, when I'm a bit tired or I just sort of ramble on. No, off. no, of course. And I appreciate you being here. It means a lot. And hopefully you'll come back in the future. I know. will. Oh, I'd love to. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. I'd love it, to. Uh, yeah. Love so, to. so, so, so last question. This is going to be more of an esoteric question, but I think you're in the milieu to, to deal with it. So, um, Sorry. In the West, there is this phenomenon called post-liberalism that is rising. There is this group of people in both America and in your country. In fact, there are some folks in your country that I could name that actually fit this phenomenon quite well. But I won't. I won't do that because I don't want to uh, upset anybody. But um, there are. Uh, but post-liberals essentially say that the reason the UK or the United States is in the state that it is in, state of cultural degradation state of political degradation, all kind of things, whether it be having to do with gender ideology, whether it be having to do with the annihilation of womanhood, whether it be having to do with how we view children now, how some people view, view, view children now politically as not innocent, but as like the sort of the, ta the tabula rasa things that can, that must have all their feelings validated, so on and so forth. All of it has to do, the, the fertility crisis, the housing crisis, all of it has to do with the failures of liberalism.
a classical liberalism. Um, and these people propose a pre-enlightenment system, sort of community-based system to deal with this. Um, a lot of them tend to support a very energetic role for the government in private life. A lot of them tend to support a uh, a sort of um, individual liberty is not their highest value. So that could lead to a certain kind of totalitarianism. They definitely support like government regulation of virtue, the promotion of certain behaviors of others, things like that. Um, in fact, if you want me, I can just name some of the people that fit this bill. Uh, oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I mean, so in, in the UK, uh, uh, Connor Tomlinson is actually a pretty uh, – pretty big uh, expositor of this viewpoint. Uh, and this is not an insult to him. This is just a fact. He blames liberalism for almost everything happening in your country right now. Um, and he very much would probably like to see a kind of system where the law is more based on, you know, sort of Burkean like tendencies over anything else. And so there are some others as well. But what's your viewpoint on this whole worldview do you think they get something wrong? Do you think that they are the path forward? If not, what is the path forward? Because, you know, reform, I've read you guys' policies and everything, is not a post-liberal party. It is very much a classically liberal, um, cultural preservationist, patriotic British party. So what's your thoughts on all of this? Well, I fundamentally, in certain respects, I, I do apologize, I'm a little bit tired. But um, I, I will make... That's okay. I, I will make the point that I certainly don't ascribe to post-liberalism as an ideology. Uh, I would say I'm in completely in lockstep with the reform platform. However, at the same time, I'm willing to acknowledge the reality that, yes, liberals are responsible for a hell of a lot of what's happened in this in our country over the last uh, 40 years. I think that the greatest threat to the Western world right now is naive liberal women who are going to keep voting in, um, you know, all of these disastrous policies. Um, I think as we're seeing in America right now, a lot of, um, you know, people are voting for Kamala Harris simply because, oh, she's brass and she has, you know, the coconut tree meme and all of that. And it's it, it's a disaster. It's that type of naive liberal thinking that's gotten us into this position in the first place. It's only going to make things get even worse. So, I, I understand where Connor is coming from and where you're coming from in that respect. But at the same time, I, 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 I still fundamentally ascribe to a classical liberal worldview. I think that the, I think that the freer the people, the, the more successful a society will be, the more stable a society will be. However, at the same time, we have to acknowledge the ignorance of many people in our society, because as we're well aware, IQs are going down, people are getting dumber and dumber. And I'm yeah. I'm afraid that people are more susceptible to manipulation from a political elite that seem determined to force upon the public, whether they like it or not, um, a multicultural society. Wow. You know, so yeah. I, I don't I don't really know what the solution is, though I wouldn't describe myself as post-liberal. I certainly don't think that is the that yeah. is the way of the future. But at, at the same time, I do understand where you lots are coming from as I share a lot of your sympathies, especially with the way in which liberals, left liberals in particular, have effectively brought upon the rest of society uh, almost quasi-hellish conditions. Yeah, and that's a good distinction to make, left liberals versus classical liberals, because left liberals are an entirely different breed of animal as opposed oh. to classical liberals. I'm a, I'm a very strong classical liberal myself, and I think the post-liberals are mistaken in several fronts, but they, they're good at identifying problems, though. A lot of the problems they point out are real problems, and we should really, and that's probably the, their greatest contribution. And so I would take that with stride. But um, Nicholas, you've been wonderful. Thank you so much for being here a little bit late at night. I appreciate it. No worries. Um, Absolutely. No worries. Always an absolute pleasure. I'd love to come back, Christian, genuinely. Yeah. If, you are, if you'll have me back, if you'll have me back. I will. I will, totally. You are a, I think you're a quality person. And so uh, you tell if there's anything else you want to say before we go, anything like you want to plug, any social media you want to plug, and then we'll get out of here. Well, um, uh, please feel free to follow me on X at uh, Nicholas Lissack, uh, L I S S A C K, or all, all one word. Uh, that would be absolutely fantastic. And also to um, to the Americans who are primarily the American audience you have, yeah, please, for the love of God, keep talking about what's happening in Britain right now because. <laughs> You know, if you're silent, you're 
you're basically letting you know your your motherland sink into the ocean sink into an orwellian nightmare and i would i would maintain that the fight in britain is so 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 important and you all need to look at what's going on in britain because this could be your reality in america come january 2025 if Kami Kamala and crazy Tim Waltz, Mr. Stolen Valor, you know, end up getting the keys to the White House, this this could become your reality. So please know what's going on in the UK. Be informed. Stay informed. Watch videos. Go onto my Twitter where I post a hell of a lot about this. Well, hopefully I'll continue to post a lot about this unless I'm arrested. Um, just just please, for the love of God, keep involving yourself in British politics. And also, I just look into Reform UK. Look into Reform UK. They are the only political party in Britain that is capable of saving the country. They are Trump-endorsed. Nigel Farage and Donald Trump are very close friends. In fact, Trump apparently watched the NEC rally and he was very impressed. So please, if you want to see Britain be made great again, support Reform UK. Promote the party. Promote the party globally because... Although we have the sort of insular view of populist national movements, it is it is more a global movement against the elite now. And we need all the help we can get, even through social media clicks. We just need all the help we can get. So please follow me on Twitter at Nicholas Lissac and support Reform UK and right. vote for Donald. Nick, thank you for being here. Everyone else, thank you for watching and please stay pensive. Bye, everyone.